We've just recently elected a Catholic president, and he is Catholic. He's baptized. He is a member of the family. We've just elected a Catholic president who is diametrically opposed to all of the basic moral principles that are proclaimed by the Roman Catholic Church. Not only abortion and the sanctity of human life, but the sanctity of marriage and this gender silliness. How in the world did that happen? A Catholic. I'll tell you, if he wasn't Catholic, I probably wouldn't be so upset. He's a member of my family. He's the most powerful man in the world. And he is absolutely opposed to the basic understandings that God is the author of life. How in the world did this happen? You want an answer? I'll tell you the answer. Because our bishops have been silent for 60 years through bad catechesis and cowardice. They have barely said a thing. A few papers here and there. They speak of, there's things they could do. You say, well, why don't you do something? I'm just a little diocesan priest. I'm a grunt. They're the apostles. They have the voice. I just work for them at their privilege. They can get rid of me tomorrow. How have they allowed this to happen? What is it that they really believe? How poorly have they educated you? Good Lord. I am angry. It's a righteous anger, the same righteous anger that Jesus had when he drove the money changers out of the temple. He didn't hate those people, but he was outraged with a sense of righteous anger. Righteous anger means I'm incensed at what you are doing to someone else and I'm called to protect. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. I have to stand up for this. Jesus had to stand up for his father's dignity. So he wanted a clean house. And I have this righteous anger. I'm just tired of this. Angry to the point where I am tempted to say this. If you are pro-abortion, I am tempted to ask you to leave St. Henry Parish. Leave this parish. Tempted to say that. Because then I think, where would you go? This is not just this parish that teaches this. This is the Catholic Church, the Holy Catholic Church of God that teaches this. What parish would accept your views? Sadly, you would find one. And that is an indictment against the bishops. But God help that parish that would let your ideas foster in their parish. And so instead, I will not ask you to leave. Why? Because this may be your only chance to repent, to change your mind, and to come to know the truth and finally embrace it. So I won't ask you to leave. This is your chance for salvation. You are welcome here. Even if you're pro-abortion, but your ideas are not welcome here and they will be given no quarter. The same with Joe Biden. He's a Catholic. He's a member of the family. If for some reason he would be in Buckeye on a Sunday, Joe Biden is welcome to come to Mass here. His ideas are not welcome here. And if you ask me a follow-up question, would you give him communion? No. Over my dead body. Not until he repents. He's a public figure. He needs to publicly repent. And we need to pray for his conversion. The five things that every Catholic needs to know about Catholic Joe Biden. Number one, Joe Biden is unabashedly pro-abortion. This fact is clear from his long voting record, his public pronouncements, his allegiance to and support of groups like Planned Parenthood and NARAL, and from his party's platform not only in this election year, 
but in their platform going back decades. He and they support abortion for any reason or for no reason, right up to and even beyond the moment of birth. He and they opposed the effort in Congress to pass legislation requiring doctors who perform abortions to provide medical care to babies who survive the abortion, opting rather to let such babies, babies simply die outside the womb with no care. He and they are pushing for the repeal of the Hyde Amendment, an action which would force all American taxpayers, including you and me, to fund abortions, to pay for them. Along with their anti-life positions on euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide, embryonic stem cell research, and other issues, the Democratic Party has become the party of death, and Catholic Joe Biden is their standard bearer. Or as he said in the first presidential debate, I am the Democratic Party. Number two. Joe Biden opposes the church's teaching on the sanctity of marriage. While he was vice president, he publicly endorsed same-sex marriage in 2012, three years before the Supreme Court ruling. And in 2016, while still the vice president, he officiated over the wedding ceremony of two men, posting a photo of the ceremony on Twitter with the caption, quote, Proud to marry Brian and Joe at my house. Couldn't be happier. Two longtime White House staffers, two great guys. End quote. Number three, a Biden presidency would be a danger to our already dwindling religious liberty. He and his party advocate for the repeal of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act which protects the religious conscience rights of health care workers who decline to participate in abortions and of church-based adoption agencies that choose to place children only with married heterosexual couples, among other things. Biden is also on record committing to restoring the Obamacare mandate requiring religious ministries and orders like the Little Sisters of the Poor to provide contraceptive and abortifacient drugs to their employees, despite the fact that that is a direct violation of their faith conviction and of church teaching. And by the way, on the subject of religious liberty, Joe Biden is on the record as saying that as president, he would not hesitate to reinstitute a nationwide pandemic lockdown if the science demands it. Undoubtedly, such a lockdown would once again close our churches. Let me remind you of what it was like for us to have no public masses and no sacraments for 11 weeks this past spring. Number four. Although Joe Biden rejects the label of socialist, his presidency would undoubtedly open the door for America to very quickly become a socialist country. Evidence for this assertion is in his signing on to the self-avowed socialist Bernie Sanders agenda, his selection as a running mate of Senator Kamala Harris, identified by bipartisan groups, by nonpartisan groups, as the most leftist member of the U.S. Senate. His several months long silence on the murder and mayhem being inflicted on America's cities by Marxist socialist organizations, as well as the all too obvious and serious influence being exercised within the Democrat Party by leftist extremists. So why, you may ask, should that be an issue of concern to Catholics? One has only to consider the lessons of history and the teachings of the popes to answer the question. For more than 200 years, wherever socialism has sought to gain a foothold, in France, following the French Revolution, in the 20th century and today, in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, in Asia, or wherever, 
The socialists have viewed the church, especially and specifically the Catholic Church, as an enemy to be destroyed, or at the very least, to be silenced and marginalized. Socialism is a soul-robbing ideology that always and inevitably leads to totalitarianism where the government presumes to put itself in the place of God in the lives of its subservient citizens. For this reason, socialism has been clearly and vigorously condemned and denounced by an unbroken string of no less than 11 consecutive popes, from Pius IX in 1849 to Benedict XVI in 2005. Mob rule is one of the chief tactics and strategies of socialism, and in a perverse twist of irony, the same socialist mobs who like to chant, silence is violence, reaped the benefit of the several months long silence of Joe Biden and his party as the mobs carried out their orchestrated campaign of violence in America's cities. Again, Joe Biden is probably personally not a socialist, but he and the Democrat Party can validly be called out for giving aid, comfort, and encouragement to those who are. Whether they be the demonic forces unleashed in the streets of America's cities by Marxist, nihilist, anarchist revolutionaries, or those in elected office in his own party who seek to push America so far to the left as to make it unrecognizable and to establish a socio-economic socio and political system that is openly hostile to the church. Number five. Joe Biden's positions on these four moral issues as a very high-profile Catholic, a man who served in the U.S. Senate for more than three decades, then as vice president for eight years, and now as a candidate for president, a very high-profile Catholic. His positions then serve to subvert and undermine the faith of nominal and poorly catechized Catholics, as, for example, it gives rise to the effort the misinformed effort known as Catholics for Biden. At least one of Biden's campaign ads picture him with Pope Francis and with a group of smiling nuns in an effort to portray himself as a devout Catholic. And by the way, when you have to tell people what a good Catholic you are, does that not make you question how good a Catholic the person really is? Ironically, it's another group of nuns, namely the Little Sisters of the Poor, who would once again be targeted by a Biden presidency for enforcement of the Obamacare mandate. Furthermore, Senator Kamala Harris, his running mate, is on record calling the Knights of Columbus, quote, an all-male extremist group. Extremist because of the Knights' clear support of church teaching on the non-negotiables that we're talking about here. And by the way, Deacon Bud, Father Rob, and I are all members of the Knights of Columbus. And yeah, we're all male. What of it? I leave it up to you to decide if we're also extremists. Also, isn't it interesting that the same leftist media which gives high praise to Joe Biden's Catholicism, while characterizing the Catholicism of Judge Amy Coney Barrett as dangerous and extremist. The perennial failure of many of our bishops to call out Biden and other Catholic politicians who publicly defy the church's most cherished moral teachings only serves to confuse many Catholics and many others in our society, causing them to think 
oh, I guess what he holds isn't that bad. Isn't that bad? The willful destruction of 61 million babies in the womb, including, by the way, 23 million black babies, isn't that bad? I ask you, what could be worse? In its, in its document entitled, Living the Gospel of Life, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops declared abortion to be the preeminent moral issue of our time. The right to life undergirds all other rights. That's why it's mentioned first in the Declaration of Independence. And it represents government's most important responsibility. So don't let anyone, be he a priest, a bishop, or a cardinal, tell you otherwise. Abortion is, I believe, spiritually speaking, both the primary cause and the primary symptom of a society in a downward death spiral. As I said, it's time for faithful Catholics to stand up and say, enough is enough. To all office holders and politicians who claim to be devout Catholics while publicly and obstinately contradicting the church and subverting her teachings. In conclusion, we are as a nation, as I stated earlier, I believe, staring into the abyss, stemming from our culture's wholesale rejection of God and his law, a rejection manifested most tangibly in five decades of legalized abortion. Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen once wrote these words almost 60 years ago, quote, a nation always gets the kind of politicians it deserves. If a time ever comes when the religious Jews, Protestants, and Catholics ever have to suffer under a totalitarian state which would deny them to them the right to worship God according to the light of their conscience, it will be because for years they thought it made no difference what kind of people represented them and because they abandoned the spiritual in the realm of the temporal." End quote. And so the bottom line, brothers and sisters, is vote. And when you do, think with the church while also understanding this, that no one running for public office is ultimately the solution for what ails America. Only God is. That's not a statement of resignation to the inevitable. It is rather a statement of hope. The late father Richard John Newhouse once wrote, Christians have not the right to despair, for despair is a sin. And we have not reason to despair, he said, quite simply because Christ is risen. You and I are called to be salt and light in a dark and dying world. And you and I, as faithful American Catholics, are engaged in a battle for the soul of our beloved nation. Let's take that call seriously. I'd like to conclude this homily with a quote from the Old Testament that you are no doubt familiar with. It's one of my very favorite scripture quotes and one which is most pertinent and most compelling for today. Second Chronicles 7.14. Almighty God declares this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. God bless you, and may God continue to bless America. Because Joe Biden masquerades as a Catholic, I'm going to use his name.
Joe Biden embraces teachings that are absolutely and fundamentally opposed to the priorities of our church to protect life, to protect the sanctity and the holiness of marriage. He is, in some respects, an embarrassment to Catholicism. There is an amendment that is written to protect your federal tax dollars, the money that you give to Caesar, that protects that money from paying directly for abortion. It's called the Hyde Amendment. Joe Biden actively wants to repeal that amendment. You know, we have at least some say in what happens to our money that we give to Caesar, don't we? Not much of a say, it seems at times, but we have at least some say in what happens to our money. There was a bill that was proposed that babies that survive the abortion process, there is a living human being in the operating room alive. There was an amendment that said that if a child survives abortion, that it must be given medical care. Joe Biden doesn't support that. He opposes the teachings of the Catholic Church. This isn't political. This is moral. This is religion. This is our faith. What is a marriage anyway? A marriage is a union of one man and one woman. How does a person get married? I had a wedding here yesterday, right here on the altar. And I explained to couples that they're only halfway married when we're done with them at the church. They're halfway married. They have one more step to go before they're completely married. What is the final step in making a marriage? It's called the consummation. Okay, how do you consummate a homosexual marriage? How is that even possible? If you attempted it, it would be called the sin of sodomy, which is one of the sins that cries out to God for vengeance, according to the clear teachings of the Catholic Church. I fear that Joe Biden has had bad shepherds, bad teachers. Maybe Cardinal McCarrick was his cardinal or priest. But the reality is he's missed fundamental Catholic teachings along the way, and he's not alone. Each one of us is going to stand before Almighty God and give an accounting of ourselves. Religious liberty. We have today the ability to refrain from the performance of abortions and those kind of things. It's called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act or healthcare workers who decline to participate in abortion and other things that they find morally objectionable are protected legally. He wants to repeal that. My brothers and sisters, this is the way evil works. It's not just let me be, you must approve of what I do. Last week, I stood up here in front of this church and I was brokenhearted at the state of Catholicism. And I'm still brokenhearted at the state of Catholicism. I will die brokenhearted at the state of the church. I'm afraid. And I think that we live in a world that uh, is this real, fundamental, and deep uh, battle. And it's not a battle over the coin that belongs to Caesar. It's a battle over our soul. And Jesus Christ established a church not to fix the political problems of the world, but to do what? To teach the truth and to save souls. My brothers and sisters, your life is precious. Do you agree with me? Your life is precious. And if your life is precious, then what? Every human life is precious. Does our law teach that? It should. The word patriotism comes from pater, and pater means father. 
We have a responsibility to be patriots. It's part of the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment is honor your father and your mother. When we think about honoring our father and our mother, that includes being good citizens of our nation. Does that make sense to you? That we have authorities that are above us and that we have to be responsible citizens? My brothers, my sisters in Christ, I don't get too excited about the RNC or the DNC or the NRA or the ACLU or about any of those things. They're all passing. They're all temporary. I am a citizen of the kingdom of Almighty God, and I find myself a temporary citizen of the United States of America. I want to be a good citizen of the United States of America, but I am first and foremost a citizen of the kingdom of Almighty God, and I want to abide by the laws of the kingdom of Almighty God, and I want to stand up for them, and if I were going to run for political office, I would want the, the most important things in my life to flow out of me into the, the lives and the, and the well-being of others? It's a very practical question that Jesus answers today. Is it lawful to pay taxes to a government that we don't agree with? And the answer to that question is yes, we do. Yes, we can pay our taxes, but we owe a greater loyalty to Almighty God. In the Roman Empire, one way they found to persecute the Christians was this, something very simple. They would say, you can worship your Jesus, you can go to mass, you can do the sacraments, you can do all of those things, but just come over here and take some of this incense and burn it to this pagan idol. If you do that, we'll leave you alone. Are we allowed to burn incense to pagan idols? We're not. We are not. There's nobody asking us to burn incense to pagan idols, but there are people asking us to approve of same-sex marriage, to approve of abortion, to approve of the stripping away of our religious freedoms. My brothers and sisters, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. And God is first. We are citizens of a kingdom a little bit about what Father Joe said last week, that as Christians, we approach our engagement in political life from a biblical worldview. That as we believe that God has created us in his image and likeness, and yet sin has come into the world and has infected the human heart and wounded the human heart in such a way that sin can't, uh, in, in other words, in order for us to solve any political problems, we need to first look at sin. In other words, as Christians, we know that politics cannot solve the world's problem because the problems are not simply about policies or politicians or structures. The problems primarily are problems of the human heart, and we need salvation. And the good news is, is that Jesus gives us salvation. He comes in and he makes us new, and he gives us the capacity to really imbue the secular culture with the truths of the gospel, with the power of transforming grace. And that is why we as Christians have a tempered expectation of what can be accomplished by politics alone. We also are very suspicious of, of, of a political approach that is atheistic and devoid of God and doesn't take seriously the reality of sin. Very skeptical of approaches that would seek to create a utopia here in this earth or just by different structures or more powerful centralized government. But paradoxically, because of the saving action of grace, we have confidence that, that we can transform culture in a way that those who aren't Christian would never have that hope. And the last thing I want to say before I begin this homily is just simply to say this. We understand as Christians that in every single political battle, there is a spiritual battle at play. For as St. Paul says, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our, our battle is not against politicians. It's not against political parties. Our battle is against principalities and powers, against Satan, against evil spirits that infect ideology, that infects the world. And so we're, we see in every political battle a spiritual battle that's primary, that needs to be addressed and understood in order... This is your chance for salvation. 
You are welcome here. Even if you're pro-abortion. But your ideas are not welcome here and they will be given no quarter. The same with Joe Biden. He's a Catholic. He's a member of the family. If for some reason he would be in Buckeye on a Sunday, Joe Biden is welcome to come to Mass here. His ideas are not welcome here. And if you ask me a follow-up question, would you give him communion? No. Over my dead body. Not until he repents. He's a public figure. He needs to publicly repent. And we need to pray for his conversion.